Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a note to our internet audience watching at home, if at any time during the presentation you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, just call the number on your screen. We'll take care of that for you. We will get it signed, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. So this evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome back Mr. Chris Gillibeau, presenting his new book, The Happiness of Pursuit, Finding the Quest That Will Bring Purpose to Your Life. Uh, we're very happy to be presenting this event in collaboration with Miami Book Fair International. And here to tell you more about this year's fair, please welcome to the microphone, Ms. Lisa Better. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lisa Better, and I work with the Miami Book Fair International. How many of you have heard about the Miami International Book Fair? Yay. How many of you are friends of the fair? Raise your hand. Yay. <laughs> well, tonight, we actually had a benefit for the friends of the fair. As you can see, we had wine and cheese. And we also are giving away Chris's amazing book um, as a perk. And as a friend of the fair, you get great benefits. Um, we have uh, wonderful author events. Um, we also have um, benefits such as ticketing, and we um, have parties. And also, it's a way for you to support the book fair, which is in November, November 16th through the 23rd. Um, if you would like to be on our email list, we have a sign-up sheet in the back. And I just wanted to welcome you and say thank you very much for coming. And enjoy, Chris. Thank you, Lisa. So as I said, we're very happy to have Chris back with us here at Books and Books. Uh, Mr. Gillibeau is an entrepreneur, traveler, and New York Times bestselling author. His first two books were The Art of Nonconformity and The $100 Startup. He is also the host of the World Domination Summit, an international gathering of creative people, so it's really less sinister than it sounds. Um, Chris recently completed his quest to visit every country in the world before the age of 35. When he set out on this journey, he never imagined that the biggest revelation would be how many people like him exist, each pursuing a challenging quest. The more he spoke with these strivers, the more he began to appreciate the direct link between questing and long-term happiness and he was compelled to complete a comprehensive study of this phenomenon and extract the best advice. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Chris Gillibeau. Thank you very much. Thank you, and hello, and good evening. Hi. So super excited to be back at Books and Books here in Miami, a beautiful bookstore in a beautiful city. And I'm so glad you're all here. I was warned that no one would come on time in Miami. <laughs> but a lot of you were here 30 minutes ago uh, or 20 minutes ago. So that's wonderful. I'm super excited to be here. Is there anyone who's actually traveled in to join us uh, from outside the greater Miami area? Would you raise your hand like an hour out or so? Hi. Where'd you come from? Orlando. Orlando. Welcome. And yourself? West Palm. West Palm. Right on. Over here? St. Pete. St. Pete. Great. You know, I'm going to Tampa tomorrow. <laughs> I'm glad you're here tonight. That's all right. Over here. You can come tomorrow night, too. Um, what? Spain. Spain. OK. <laughs> Amazing. You win the most traveled award. There's some wine and cheese for you somewhere. Um, anyone else? Everybody else is just Miami traffic, which is no small challenge. But yet you undertook the challenge, and here you are. I just saw you in Boston a couple of days ago, and now here you are back. That's great. It was good to see Isabella before. Hi, Isabella. Wave your hand. Isabella asked me if this is uh, for Alexander is awesome tonight. And I said, no, it's not. But it will be awesome. <laughs> it will be great. So whether you came from Orlando or from Spain or just across town, I realized that you had a choice to make tonight. And maybe you had a long day. Maybe there's a lot going on. Maybe you did have to, have to battle the traffic. Um, but for whatever reason, you chose to be here with us tonight. And I'm glad you made that choice. And I hope it's a good use of your time. I hope that we can all go away saying, yeah, that was a good time. But not only was it a good time, maybe I actually learned something. I probably didn't learn it from Chris, 
but maybe I met someone else <laughs> who was there, and I learned something, and I was thinking differently about how I can apply something uh, to my life. So uh, I've done maybe 150 of these kinds of events. Um, this is a very new tour. It just started last week. Um, the book has just been out for six days, so I'm still fresh. But um, in doing all these other events, I have learned that the most important thing about this experience uh, is not the time when I'm sharing here to you, but it really is everyone else who's here. So do be sure and meet someone um, before the night is over. Even if you're a shy introvert like me, sometimes I ask the introverts to raise their hands. That never goes well. <laughs> They're always like, OK, a little bit, you know. But really, it's OK. So what I'd like to do with you tonight, um, I don't want to read to you from the book. I presume that you can all read if you want to read the book. Uh, I'd like to have a conversation. And as part of that, I will talk for maybe 20 minutes or so. I will tell you some stories about the book and why I wrote it. And then we'll do question and attempted answer, QAA, as I call it. Um, and I might get stuck, so if you ask a question, be prepared to help with the answer. And, um, and then we'll just hang out. And I'll be happy to sign books uh, or just say hello. Uh, and again, meet someone because everyone is great. OK, so as we get started, I'd like to ask you all a serious question. How many of you have ever played the video game Super Mario Brothers? Would you raise your hand? <laughs> OK. It's all right. Pretty, pretty good per capita Mario Brothers crowd here tonight. And if you haven't, it's OK. Don't worry. You won't be excluded. Um, I won't be talking about video games all night. But at the same time, uh, this particular game is a transgenerational video game. It first came out 28 years ago. I remember playing Mario Brothers with my grandma. And my dad also liked to play, but he wasn't as good as my grandmother. <laughs> and so um, whenever I got stuck on the water level, I would pass the controller to her, and she would help me out, and then I would keep going. And so for those of you who remember Super Mario Brothers, you may recall that there are numerous stages, numerous levels, all these things you have to go through, lots of enemies and obstacles and puzzles. But you're not doing it for no reason. There's actually a goal. There's a destination. There is something that you, this Italian plumber, are working <laughs> toward. You are on a quest. And so open question, what is that destination? What are you trying to achieve as Mario? Find the princess in the castle. You are trying to find the princess in the castle. Very good, sir. Does everyone remember that, who's played the game? You were trying to rescue the princess. That's right. Uh, who was this princess? Next question. Peach. Peach, Peach yeah. was the princess. Over which kingdom did the princess rule? Mushroom. Mushroom. Who said that? That's pretty good. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> who else knew that? Because almost no one ever knows that. That's great. Um, who was Mario's adversary? Bowser. Bowser. All right. Does anyone know the backstory of Bowser? Does anyone know the history of why this large turtle was so angst-ridden that he had to capture a princess and take her away from her home and inspire all of this? Yeah, there's actually not a backstory, yeah. right? <laughs> there's actually none, right? You are just kind of, as the player, you just start playing this game and you're like, there's a princess. She's been kidnapped. I got to go save her, right? I'm not going to ask a lot of questions because this is the task that's set in front of me. And essentially, the whole game is all about the challenge. The whole game is about the process. It's about going stage by stage, level by level. So if you've never played the game, it's OK. Uh, how many of you, raise your hands, have ever seen a Star Wars movie? Any Star Wars movie? Any Star Trek movie? Indiana Jones movie? Oh, OK, I got you to raise your hand. That's great. <laughs> um, Lord of the Rings movie. You've seen one of these movies. OK, great. I'm looking across the room. Wonderful. Is there any one person here who has never seen any one of these movies? Not one. The other night in Atlanta, there was someone. And I said, great, you know, my next book will be written for you. <laughs> and you and I will have a little meetup of two people. And we'll talk about it. But for now, I'll talk to everyone else. So since all of you have seen at least one of these movies, you probably know that there is a common theme that a lot of these kind of stories undertake. And these stories always involve a goal or a destination. 
There is something that the hero or the heroes are working towards. There is usually a number of stages and steps or milestones along the way. You don't just kind of set out and then achieve the goal right away. It takes some time. And then the other thing is that challenge, as I alluded to earlier, challenge is ever present. And challenge is the essence of these stories. In fact, um, challenge is what it's all about and the process and the journey and the struggle. It's what all of these stories are about. The Lord of the Rings was originally a 2100 page series of books that was then abridged into a nine hour trilogy of movies. Um, and a lot like Mario Brothers, uh, it was really all about the process and the journey and the challenge. And that's actually what we like. That's what we want. That's what we expect when we consume a book, a movie, a video game. We actually want the challenge. We don't want it to be too easy. We don't want to rescue the princess right away. We want to fail along the way and then regroup and try again. In the stories of old, the mythologies of old, there was often a situation of a hero or a group of heroes you know, who were being sent out from a village to reclaim something that had been lost to recapture something, to defend the village. And they had to go on an epic voyage. And a lot of things had to happen along the way. And eventually, they would come to a final battle, right? There's this long process, 10 years, 20 years, or something. You know, We would not want it to be where the heroes are sent out. And it's supposed to be super difficult. But then, actually, there's a nonstop flight to their destination. And then there's a dragon they're supposed to fight. But they get to the dragon, and he's asleep. And they're like, cool. And there's a ring. And they just take the ring, and they're like, back the next day. Like, that would be the most boring movie. That would be the most boring story because there would be no challenge. There would be no process. There would be no journey. So there's one more thing that all of these stories have in common that I've mentioned thus far. And that is that these stories that I've told about Mario, about Star Wars, about Lord of the Rings, mythology, all of these stories are not true. These are stories that are fictional. They are made up. They are created. I hope I'm not breaking any news to anyone. <laughs> we won't discuss Christmas or Santa Claus, any, nothing about that, OK? Um, it doesn't mean that these stories have no value. They can still have a lot of value. They can have entertainment value. We can enjoy them. We could even be inspired by them, perhaps, to do something else in our lives. Um, but fundamentally, they aren't true. They're, they're made up fictional stories. About 10 years ago, I began the study and the experience of real life quests, of real life adventures, of epic voyages and grand journeys and challenges and processes and struggles that were true, that actually happened, that people in our modern age um, had chosen to adapt and to pursue and to strive toward. And last year, this quest of a quest led me to a flight to Norway. And I flew to Norway. I think you were there, yeah. right? That's great. I flew with a number of friends and family members. And Norway is not an especially difficult country to get to. It's a beautiful country, but it's very easy. If you want to go to Norway, you just buy a ticket and you go. Um, but for me, it was special because it was the culmination of a 10-year quest to visit every country in the world. Um, and as I touched down in Norway with friends, readers, family, I reflected on everything that happened you know, over the past 10 years. And I thought about, like, why, why did I begin this journey? You know, why did I choose to visit 193 countries, every single country in the world? And, and you know, why did I do that? And the first thing I thought of was I always liked lists. I always liked writing things down. And I was always really interested in writing down my tasks and my to-do lists. And once I started traveling, I, I went to West Africa. I lived in Sierra Leone for a year, in Liberia for a year, traveled a lot around the region, started making a list of my countries, you know, of places I had been to. And then after I'd been to maybe 15 or 20 countries, you know, I set an initial goal of going to 100. And I said, you know, maybe one day in my life, like who knows how long it would take. It'd be really awesome if I could say at the end of my life I'd been to 100 
countries, about half of them, you know. And then as I worked closer toward that goal, you know, I began to see, okay, well, 100 countries is nice, but, you know, the greater challenge would be to go to all of them, right? No exceptions, you know, no exclusions. Um, so maybe the first point on that is that confidence actually comes through experience. You don't actually begin a quest necessarily with a lot of confidence. You don't actually have all of the vision. But as I traveled out of my love of travel and my love of lists, um, and I wrote my countries down, I gained the courage, if you would, um, or at least the confidence um, to pursue a greater goal. And speaking of goals, um, I was always very goal oriented. I don't know how many of you would describe yourself that way. Um, but for me, I was goal oriented, perhaps sometimes to a fault. In fact, um, as I was finishing my quest, uh, my brother sent me an email. And in the email, he, the subject line was, uh, Chris, here's your next quest. And it included this link to a Wikipedia article. The Wikipedia article was about Nando's, which is a South African fast food restaurant chain. They have locations in about 25 countries. And kind of buried in the text of this Wikipedia article was this little one-liner about a promotion that they had where if someone can visit every Nando's location in all 25 countries and save their receipts, um, then they will give you free food for life, basically. Wow. And obviously, my brother meant this as a joke. Um, but when I looked at it for just a moment, I was like, huh, that's interesting. What does that look like? How many locations are there? And why didn't I save my receipts? You know? um, so thankfully, I didn't pursue that quest. Um, that wasn't something that I chose to do. But I did pursue the quest of going to every country in the world. And I worked toward it um, you know, year after year uh, for 10 and a half years until last year when I flew to Norway. And as happens with every good quest, along the way I met a lot of people. I met a lot of amazing, really interesting, remarkable people who were all doing their own projects, who all had their own work and things that they had loved. And at a certain point, I thought, you know, I'm not the only person on a quest. I'm not the only person who chooses, you know, to, to place adventure as, as one of their values and live their life that way. So I started studying and interviewing and researching and trying to figure out why do other people undertake quests. So I met a lot of great people, a lot of really fantastic stories. Um, there was a man who ran 250 marathons in a single year. There was a young woman, a teenager actually, who sailed around the world in a small sailboat. Uh, she actually became the youngest person ever to do that. There was another man who took a 17-year vow of silence and did not speak for 17 years and also didn't use motorized transport and walked across America and uh, earned a master's degree and then a PhD. Um, initially all, all out of an environmental protest, uh, but then in a mission of self-discovery. Lots of people doing really fantastic things like that. And those were great stories. I wrote about them in the book. But I also thought, in some ways, it was actually more interesting to see and to hear other stories. Stories of how ordinary people, just like me, maybe just like some of us here, who weren't able to take a 17-year vow of silence, perhaps, uh, who didn't want to sail you know, around the world in a small sailboat, um, or even people who didn't want to visit every country in the world, um, to see how these people had found a way to pursue a quest of their own, or to cultivate the value of adventure in their lives. My favorite story in this regard is the story of Sasha Martin. And Sasha is a young mother from Oklahoma. Sasha actually grew up in Europe and some other different places, but then she's kind of settled down. She married this guy and they had a daughter. And Sasha was thinking, you know, I can't travel right now, but I want to raise my family with an international perspective. I want to show my daughter the world beyond Oklahoma. How can I do that? And Sasha had a culinary arts degree. So instead of visiting every country in the world, she decided to cook a meal from every country in the world. Uh, beginning from when her daughter Ava was six months old, first beginning to eat solid food, first meal is Afghan chicken. Started with Afghanistan. 
and then went all the way through, that's right, A to Z, all the way through the alphabet. Um, and this goal wasn't just cook a bunch of foreign food. You understand? It became a quest because it was to cook a meal from every country in the world. It had this specific parameter to it. And during the week, she would study up, and she would research recipes. She would play music from that country. She would post an image of that country's flag. So it's not only about food, it's also about culture. It's about people. It's about, again, you know, raising her family with this international perspective. And then she began posting these recipes online, and other people engaged with them and began doing it in their families as well. So she found a way to pursue a quest um, to cultivate the value of adventure, um, despite not being able to travel. So uh, I am a slow learner. It took me 10 years to learn something. But I did learn a few things through this process, um, through meeting all these great people and hearing their stories. I actually learned 13 things, but I won't tell you 13 now. I know it's been a long day. So I'll tell you three things. I'll tell you three lessons, and then we'll have a conversation. And we'll do questions and attempted answers, and we'll hang out. Lesson number one, you must believe in your dream, even if no one else does. So when I first had this idea to go to every country in the world, uh, to me it felt like a crazy idea. It was just this thing. I was like, is it possible? Can I do that? What's that look like? Uh, and I immediately dismissed it, but then I kept thinking about it. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And a lot of the people that I talked to who had all pursued quests or adventures, they used very similar language. They all said, I had this crazy idea in my head that wouldn't leave me alone. And I knew that if I didn't pursue it, I would regret it. Some of them even said, you know, I, even if I failed along the way, I could deal with that. Like if I attempted the quest or the adventure and then I failed, that would be disappointing. But to not attempt it, you know, that is unacceptable. So I had this crazy idea. You know, eventually I took action on it. Um, there was a, a young guy from, from Portland, Maine named Nate Dam. And his, his goal or his crazy idea before it became a goal uh, was to walk across America. He said, I want to leave my home in Maine I want to walk to the San Francisco Bay. I don't know how long that'll take. I don't know what's involved with that, but you know, I want to do that. Crazy idea, wouldn't leave him alone. Kept thinking about it. Finally, he did leave his home in Maine. And seven and a half months later, um, he arrived in San Francisco. And he talked about, when I asked him about the challenges, I was like, what was difficult? What was hard? You know, how did you get through it? He said a really interesting thing. He said, you know, there were a lot of things that, that were really hard about that. There were a lot of external things. It was physically difficult, kind of got injured along the way. I also had some emotional stuff. I just had this breakup I was processing. So all these different things, right? Lots of times that I wanted to give in or didn't quite you know, know if I had the motivation to keep going. He said, but what I realized was all I had to do every day was walk. Really, all I had to do was put one foot in front of the other. That was the sole task that I had. And if I didn't do anything else, and all I did was make a little bit of progress on the walk, then eventually I would achieve the goal. So he said, actually, it was quite simple. You know, it sounds like it's a grandiose thing, but it actually was quite simple. I really related to what he said, because that's how I felt about going to every country in the world. I felt like I'm a list maker. I've got lists. I've got my list of all the countries. You know, there's going to be challenges, but I'm aware of that. I know how many countries I need to go to each year. I'm going to be making incremental progress just like those stages or those levels in Mario Brothers. You know? I'm, I'm going to derive satisfaction from each step along the way, or at least from some of the milestones. Right? You must believe in your dream, even if no one else does. Lesson number two, unhappiness, or as I call it in the book, discontent, can be a source of positive change. So discontent, unhappiness, can actually be a very positive and powerful motivator. A lot of the people that I talked with, when they discussed, like, here's why I, why I did this, you know, here's why I undertook this mission, uh, they began with a sense of feeling unsettled. It doesn't mean that they were miserable, although in some cases they were. In some cases they had a terrible situation, and they wanted to just change that, and they wanted to leave that entirely and begin something new. But in other cases, they had a pretty good life. 
and maybe they had a good job or good self-employment or whatever they did, and they had good relationships, um, but they still felt like there was more they wanted to do, and they felt this, this longing to create something or to follow a path or to carve their own path, and they had what I called this discontent. But then instead of just letting that discontent kind of sit there or pretending to ignore it, because it doesn't usually go away, they combined discontent with specific action. They took discontent and they combined it with the inspiration of something they loved to do or something that had always interested them they didn't know much about or that crazy idea they had in their, he their head or something that just bothered them, essentially. Something that bothered them about the world and they wanted to find a way to correct it or make a small change. So they combined discontent with inspiration and they took action. The third and final lesson is that thinking about the end of our lives can help us with the rest of our lives. So what I mean by this, I noticed that a lot of the people I studied and interacted with who had all these different kinds of projects, again, they, all, they weren't always like you know, super big things, but they had found a way to really pursue something they loved and they, they crafted these parameters around them which were self-reinforcing. A lot of them used similar language. And just as they said things about being discontented or a little bit unhappy or unsettled, and just as they had that crazy idea or that thought that wouldn't leave them alone, and when they thought about regret, they realized they had to do this, they also used language like, I want to make my life count. I want to make each day matter. A lot of them used the word urgency. They said things like, I, I just, I want to to live with urgency. You know, I feel like I, I have a lot, I have been given a lot of gifts and I, I want to make sure that I put them to good use. Some of them had had a brush with death. Some of them had experienced the loss of a family member or a close friend or someone. Others had just always been sensitive to death and they thought about mortality and they expressed what I called an emotional awareness of mortality. And I just you know, define that difference as saying an emotional awareness of mortality is where not only you realize that everyone will die one day, but you actually realize that you, in fact, will die. And if this sounds depressing, it's not meant to be. Most of the people that I talked with, they expressed this in very positive terms. They talked about how they wanted to, to make their lives count again. They wanted to do something that mattered. They wanted to, to, to pursue that thing, whatever it would be, even if they weren't sure what it is, even if the confidence came as they pursued the experience. There was a woman from the Midwest named Phoebe Snetzinger, and Phoebe, around the age of 38 or so, uh, began an interest in nature, in the environment, and specifically in birds, and she began to pursue this hobby of bird watching. So bird watching is all about going out and, and documenting birds and seeing different species and writing them down. Again, you must believe in your dream even if no one else does, so you might not be super into birds. It's cool. Um, but she was, and just as she was pursuing this hobby and starting to learn about the world, and she went on her first foreign trip at the age of 38, just as she was starting to pursue this, um, she received what was initially a terminal diagnosis of cancer. And her first thought upon receiving this diagnosis was, oh no, there's so many more things I want to do. There's so many things that I feel are left undone. And Phoebe resolved to spend the rest of her life, however much time that would be, um, to pursue this quest you know, of seeing as many birds as she could and traveling around the world and, and going to rainforests and jungles in the Amazon and Africa. And fortunately, in Phoebe's case, the diagnosis was premature. And she actually lived for more than 20 years after that. And she spent almost the entire time pursuing this quest. Uh, and before she died, she saw more birds than anyone else in history. She set the Guinness World Record, actually, for seeing more birds than anyone. Um, this was a record that had previously only been held by men. And she chose, you know, in that, that twilight zone where she wasn't sure, does she have more time, does she not, she chose to really focus uh, on that quest. So one story from my childhood. Uh, when I was young, I was sometimes dragged to a number of religious services um, that were kind of traditional and conservative 
And in some ways, they were well-meaning, and there were some good things associated with that. But I noticed that there was often a lot of emotional appeals about death, about mortality. And there was often this challenge that was kind of issued. And this challenge had something to do with a scenario in which supposedly all of us were going to be in one day, and we would have to choose if we would be willing to die for our faith. I don't know if any of you ever had that experience. I hope not. But uh, when you know, this appeal was made, it was kind of like, you know, you have to be able to choose. Like, you know, are you going to, to live and renounce your faith? Or are you going to die? You know? And as I grew up, I kind of realized um, what a limited question that was. Because regardless of who you are, what you believe about anything, uh, almost none of us actually gets to answer a question of what we'd be willing to die for. That almost never happens. That is something that happens in mythology. That is something that happens in the movies. Um, but in real life, almost, almost no one gets to choose like, what they're willing to die for. But here's the interesting thing. All of us, again, no matter our background, no matter what we believe, all of us every single day have the chance to answer a much better question. And that question is, what's worth living for? What would you be willing to live for? What would you be willing to craft a life around? to build a foundation upon? What's your quest? What's your adventure? What service will you offer to the world? And that's something that we can create every day, we can renew every day, we can experiment, we can try different things. If something doesn't work out, that's okay, that's all right. Again, I came to this quest through a love of travel initially, a love of people, a love of different experiences and challenge. And you know, the more I pursued traveling, the more I thought, wouldn't it be fun you know, to travel more? And then I came across the idea of going to every country. Uh, and that came about through experimentation. That came about through being willing to embrace adventure and, and try different things. And, and I was really unconfident in the beginning and really scared in lots of ways. Um, but I'm so glad that I did it. I'm so glad that I said yes to adventure. And I think it's always important um, as an author, I'm sure many of you are authors and have written books as well, I think it's always important to answer the question, why did you write this book? And in my case, what I hoped to accomplish with this book, I didn't want to write a memoir. It's not just a bunch of travel stories about you know, my stuff around the world. Um, it's not just a bunch of stories about other people, even though I wanted to include those as well. Um, but the book really has a message to it. And the message is that a quest can bring purpose and meaning to your life. And cultivating the value of adventure in your life, however you choose to do that, however you choose to embrace it, can improve your life. It can make your life better. So I think there's a princess for you to rescue somewhere. I think there's a galaxy for you to save somewhere. A lot of the people that I talked with, um, they used this language about how they felt once they found what their thing was, which again, sometimes took them some time. Once they found what it was, uh, they felt like it was a calling. It was something that they had to do. In fact, in some ways, they said, you know, I, I set out to, to find a quest, or I set out to find this, this journey or this thing I'm supposed to do. But in the end, actually, the quest chose me. You know, in the end, in fact, like I, I was enveloped in this thing, and it made my life better. And that's certainly how I, I feel. So. Once you start to go down the road of adventure, you don't always know where you're going to end up. You may even end up on a Wednesday night in Miami <laughs> with a lot of amazing people here at Books and Books. Mm -hmm. and so I'm grateful to Books and Books, to all the people making that happen, and I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's have a conversation. If you have a question or a comment, raise your hand. What's your next quest? What's my next quest? What was your name? Marcel. Sorry, Victor, did you want to do something no, with I the was microphone? Just say, folks, uh, for a conversational format, if when you have a question, you raise your hand, let me get to you with the microphone so uh, all of us here in the house can hear your question. But this, we already heard it. <laughs> Great. OK. So the first question was, what's your next quest? Um, I don't think the next quest will be a, a super travel quest in the same way that the first one was. I'm not going to the moon. I'm not going to like every planet, you know. Um, someone said the other night, they're like, you should go back to every country in reverse order. And I said, you should do that. That sounds great. Um, so for me, you know, every quest involves transformation or change. And uh, for me, the, probably the greatest thing that happened along the way was 
I went from just doing this thing on my own uh, to being surrounded by all these great people, you know, all along the way participating online, offline meetups. And I'm trying to focus much more on community. So whatever the next quest will be, I think we'll focus much more on bringing people together and, and helping people to live unconventional lives, again, whatever that looks like for them. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Yadi again. Hey, Yadi. Uh, my question is, did you have a checklist when you got to every country and mm. kind of check that off when you were there? Did I have a checklist? Yeah. Like a list of things to, things do? to do? Things to do. No, I, I actually wasn't that strategic. Um, because it developed along the way, so um, it probably would have been better if I had like a sign or something, you know, or like some, you know, some series of actions or some symbol or something that I had to complete. But I, I really didn't. Um, uh, you know, in my case, um, I, I was always in a country for at least several days. Um, I didn't count airport stops. I didn't count transits. Um, a lot of these countries I was in for weeks and sometimes months. Um, but there were also some shorter visits as well. And, and um, I wasn't trying to be an expert on every country in the world. In fact, I started doing less you know, at, toward the end. I, I didn't read guidebooks. I just decided to go and see what would happen. You know, In the beginning, I carried this camera around. And I took photos, because that's what you're supposed to do when you travel. And I didn't like that. Like, I realized like 30 countries in, I'm like, why am I, I'm not a good photographer. I don't actually enjoy this process. There's, there's many skilled photographers here who are wonderful. For me, I'm not good at that. I felt this pressure. I was like, I'm supposed to be taking photos because I am in this foreign country. And once I stopped doing that and just kind of enjoyed myself and went on long walks and talked with people. That's, that's what I enjoyed about it. So I didn't have a checklist. With apologies to the introverts in the audience. Here you uh -huh. go. Halfway. Um, have any of the countries that you went to uh, no longer exist or new ones popped up? <laughs> oh, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I was kind of worried like once I began, like if the whole, you know, geographic surface would change, you know, or something. Um, none of them have ceased to exist, which is probably good for them. Um, but about midway through, um, South Sudan gained independence. And so my initial list was 192. And so I added on South Sudan and I went there. So the completed list was 193. So fortunately, there aren't new countries that are added that often. It usually happens about every 10 years. Um, the previous one was East Timor. So I think Victor's gonna, gonna facilitate. Hey, Isabella. If you had to pick one wish, what would it be? Like one way in life, what would it be? Wow, no one has ever asked that before. <laughs> That's amazing. If I had to pick one wish, I really don't know. I, I mean, I would like, I would, my wish would be, let me think about it for a little bit. Um, <laughs> That's amazing question. Do you have an answer to that? Can I ask you? I would love that answer. She would keep on going. That's, that's beautiful. Thank you. I will think about my one wish. Traveling to these countries, did you have a dietary restriction or were you always open to eating food, the local cuisine? Yeah, um, I tried to be as open as possible. I, I'm vegetarian, actually. I became vegetarian about halfway through. Um, nothing bad happened. I just kind of made that choice. Um, so um, I, I think even within that constraint that I had, I was still able to eat a lot of different things. Um, and in, in fact, um, kind of kind of began as a um, pretty pretty boring basic palate. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I went to Burger King like four times a week, um, and finally grew out of that, which is great. So I, st I mean, I, through my travels, I came to love the food of, of South Asia, uh, Indian food, Pakistani food is probably my favorite. I came to love the food of Ethiopia. Uh, I came to love Thai and Lao food, um, and so I actually learned to like a lot of different food through travel, but. I, I didn't eat the goat when I went to Somalia. That was probably the one thing that I, that I was a little bit not going to do. So. It's a two-part question. Yes. Um, an inspirational quote, and what is the last book that you read? An inspirational quote. Um, so the mantra or the, mes the, like the message of what I'm trying to do with Art of Nonconformity is a modified quote, which I would probably get wrong. Um, but I believe the quote is by Alan Keatley, and it's in my email signature if I've ever wrote you. And the quote is, once in a while, um, it really hits someone that they don't have to experience the world in the way they have been told to. And 
So I think that refers to an awakening or some, some moment you're like, hey, I don't actually have to, to do this, right? Um, and so the, the, the core message of the art of nonconformity, my blog and all my work is you don't have to live your life the way others expect. You can do good things for yourself and for others um, at the same time. It's not a false choice. It's not a dichotomy. So that's my inspirational quote. Um, right now I'm reading a novel um, called Orfeo. It's by Richard somebody. He wrote a book called Generosity. He's written about eight novels. Um, he's, and so I mostly read literary fiction. And my, the previous novel I read was uh, Haruki Murakami's latest work, which is really good. So I'll let Victor, Victor choose who's doing questions. Hi, Chris. Thank you for coming and speaking to all Thank of you. us today. Um, my question was, in meeting all of these people, did you meet anyone? And, and, and I haven't had a chance to read the book, so there may, it may be in there. But like someone who set out on a quest, but then like just went in a totally different direction than the, the initial quest that they set out to? This is a great question. I feel like I have planted you here to ask that question. <laughs> so thank you, even though I did not. Um, so let, let's talk about giving up for a moment. Uh, I, I think it's really terrible advice to give people and say, like, never give up. You know, I think that's just terrible because there's all kinds of times in life when you could be doing something that makes you miserable and you should stop, right? You should give up. It doesn't matter what you've invested in that. Like, it, like you should just change course. So in the, in the case of a quest, um, there was one great story that I, I did write about, and it's the story of this guy named Mark Boyle, who is from England. And his quest, as he in initially thought, uh, was to walk from England to India without spending any money. <laughs> and so, yeah, he thought it was pretty awesome. And um, he was a hero in England. Like, the press is, like, writing him up. Like, here's this dude. He's going to, like, walk, you know, to India without spending any money. And people are like, oh, that's awesome. We'll, like, buy you a beer. And then he left England, and nobody knew who he was. And he wasn't, <laughs> able, to, he wasn't able to communicate. And pe people thought he was a beggar. And the whole point wasn't to beg. He was actually trying to barter and work. And he was trying to teach people about a world, you know, without money. That was his thing. And so it didn't actually go super great. And about a month in, uh, he left, he quit, and he went back to England, you know, feeling really, you know, shamed and embarrassed. And um, he processed it and kind of thought about it. And a couple months in, he realized, important realization, uh, his main goal had nothing to do with walking to India. Uh, his main goal had to be with, with showing people, you know, his vision for a world without money. And so he modified the quest, and he found a way to live in England uh, for three years without money. And again, he wasn't a beggar. He was bartering. He kind of created this whole barter economy you know, where he lived his entire life and did everything and provided for himself and wrote about it uh, without spending money. So he modified his quest. He focused on what the value was, right, as opposed to what the initial vision was. Totally OK to do that. And then I'll take a question at the back of the room. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. For you, the gentleman in the front left, is your quest to follow him <laughs> wherever yeah. he goes on his book tour? Um, no, it's not, but go ahead, you, go ahead, answer. Well, actually, it's funny. With the, um, I learned about uh, travel hacking and, and you know, finding ways to travel affordably uh, through, his, through his writings. And, uh, but I had never traveled overseas before. And then it was right around that time, uh, you, you were just finishing up, and I thought, oh, well, wouldn't that be kind of funny with, if I do my first country or oh. my first overseas trip uh, to the person who inspired me? Oh. Yay. Oh, wow. Cute. Fun times. And now, so here's the rest of the story, though. Now you're preparing to, to go on a round the world trip of your own, right? Exactly. And you're going to do, like, I don't know, 10 countries, 20 countries or something? Like, some amount. Some amount. A bunch of countries yeah. he's going to go to. Uh, kind of open ended to. Uh, I don't quite know what my quest is, but I think I need to travel to find it. Yeah, that's and, great. And my question to you is, how did you handle going to places like North Korea and Iran? Yeah, so um, there's actually there's actually not many of those kinds of places. You know, when people say, like, what about the all... It's actually a pretty short list, you know. So we're talking about 193 countries. You know, I would say, like, 100 are pretty easy to go to. Anybody can go to. 50 more you can get to with a little bit of work, right? And so we're talking about like the final 40, and even those are not necessarily like dangerous countries or something. They just, most of them just require a little bit more effort on the visa processing, or some of them are, are just super remote. There's a lot of islands in the South Pacific in which there's only like one or two flights a week, and there's only nine people a week allowed to go, and so a lot of logistics with that. 
Um, but as for like Iran, Afghanistan, um, you know, North Korea, one thing I learned is there's often, um, there's often another way to go to a country. There might be a cultural exchange. There might be a tour that you can participate in. As an American, you can go on a tour in Iran. It's a, it's a state-sanctioned kind of thing, but you can do it. Um, you can go to North Korea on a, on, a, on a tour, and you fly to Beijing, and then you fly to Pyongyang, and they take your cell phone away from you, which is a little inconvenient. Um, but then, you know, four days later, you get it back and you leave. Um, so there, there's always a, there's usually a way. I only got stuck maybe like five times toward the end. Um, Eritrea was one really difficult one. I actually got deported from Eritrea. I almost got deported a couple of other places, but Eritrea actually did get deported. But that was the only time that happened out of 193 countries. So, Why? what? Why would I do, was I deported? Uh, because Eritrea and Ethiopia are essentially at war right now, and the U.S. government officially supports Ethiopia. So they're not super excited about Americans coming at this time. But I made it. <laughs> back here? Yeah, oh, sorry, back there. Hi. Uh, hey, thank up? you for your story. I, uh, my friends thought I traveled a lot because Brunei, about a month ago, was my 104th country. So Amazing. That's um, Congratulations. So wow. so no, a round of applause for him. That's great. <laughs> no, I, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't say this to prop myself, but it, it's just that, wow, I'm, I'm truly amazed. But one of the problems or concerns that I've always had through my journey traveling around the world was the issue of social justice, mm. especially in countries like, from what I could remember, Mauritania and Lesotho and some of the other countries. And how have you dealt with when you saw things in front of you that were so blatant and yet you couldn't take action? Right, that's a wonderful question. I would love to know your answer to that as well at some point, maybe later. Excuse me as I walk into the podium. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a complex issue. You know, I, I think you have issues of corrupt governments all over the world, um, governments which are essentially you know, impoverishing their citizens. Um, lots of countries that could actually be very rich, a number of them in Africa, like Equatorial Guinea, but you know, the population is quite poor. Uh, and so it is, I mean, again, lots of issues, you know, the whole issue of do you travel there in the first place or not, because you're effectively supporting the regime, right? Um, you know, I guess in my case, I tried as much as possible to, you know, book local accommodation in those cases um, to see what I could do that would be supporting a local economy rather than the government economy, but it's, it's not always possible to do that. Um, you know, as for responding to needs locally, um, I spent four years, you know, working in Sierra Leone and Liberia on a hospital ship, and I, I got, got some experience through seeing kind of, you know, what is the best way to respond to needs. And, and my personal belief is uh, I try to support local organizations, uh, local NGOs, um, and good charities um, that are doing work there. So I support the work of Charity Water, uh, Pencils of Promise, a number of other, you know, big and small organizations, but I don't usually give directly when I'm there, just because I don't have the knowledge to do that. You know, it's, I, don't, I don't actually think it's helpful for particularly a Western traveler to fly to a country they've never been to and go to the village and say, oh, I'm going to solve a problem. Actually, I think that causes more harm than, than good. So that's my, that's my belief. But I'd love to hear yours maybe later. Congratulations on 104 countries. Um, I hope it, this comes out in the best <laughs> possible way that I can express it. But I feel, and I want to get your opinion, that depression, anxiety, mm. and all the, uh, the problems that we have might be because we're not chasing our quest mm. or we're quiet, quieting down our quest. How do you feel? Yes. How do I feel? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have struggled from time to time with depression and anxiety and you know, those issues are, are clinical issues. It's not so much you can say, here, you're depressed, do this, right? Because um, they are complex and, you know, you should receive treatment or whatever. But I, I, I would say that, you know, in my life, when I think about, okay, what makes me happy? Um, striving is something that makes me happy and building towards something makes me happy. And when I say a quest can bring purpose and meaning to your life, you know, in my case, uh, I did derive a lot of satisfaction from the quest um, because I knew I always had something to work toward and it gave me this foundation. And I was doing lots of other stuff too. But because I had the, the project with the parameters, again, it wasn't just like I'm traveling to a bunch of countries. It's like, no, every country in the world by my 35th birthday and this choice is going to inform a lot of other choices for me. 
um, for me, it was very positive. You know, I don't want to say it solved my depression, um, but I would say it was very good for me. And it definitely helped me, and it gave me confidence. Um, it, it helped me to, to envision just uh, a better future for myself. It helped me to kind of think about different kinds of work that I had never imagined before. So for me, it was very good. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks for coming to Miami. Hey, what's up? Hey. Yeah, of course. So whether someone intends on it or not, I heard you say all quests involve transformation. What was the most meaningful transformation or outcome of your quest to see yeah. every country for you? Yeah, um, definitely. I think the most meaningful would be what I, what I briefly mentioned about um, I began as an independent traveler, was, was always just totally by myself. I could go for you know, 10 days and in some places might not even be around other people. And that was OK for me. I didn't mind it. You know? But um, then like I started writing about it. And people started following and started using social media for the first time, you know, five years ago. And there were all these great people all over the place. And um, I had to, I, I, I found my worldview challenged and changed, not, not by people arguing with me necessarily, but just by seeing a different way of life. And by understanding um, that people are different around the world. And that's the beauty of it. It's OK. I don't believe that everyone's the same all over the world. I think that, that cultures and people are actually quite different. And that's good. So. Once I started, you know, embracing that more, that was that was probably the biggest change for me. Right, a couple of questions back here. Mm -hmm. Hi, Chris. It's really exciting that you're here in Miami. Thank I've been you. following you for a long time. I wrote my book around the time you wrote yours. Oh, great. And I'm blessed that I get to work with singles and help mm -hmm. them to I pursue helping them to find extraordinary love. And I couldn't do what I do without my husband's support mm -hmm. and sharing values and sharing a vision. So what is it like for you? Behind every great man is a woman. Uh -huh. So how do you? Think do, you do you think that's true? <laughs> I do. <laughs> that's great. No, that's great. So how do you navigate? You've traveled all over the world, sure. and I'm sure you couldn't do it. You know, how do you navigate sure, sure. that as a couple, being together, and uh -huh. what is that like? Um, sometimes it's been a challenge. Sometimes it's been a struggle. Yeah. You know, I always I would always want to give you an honest answer. So since you ask an honest question, that's the honest answer. Can you tell us about your book? What is your book? Yes, so I wrote a book called Meet to Marry, a Dating Revelation for the Marriage Minded. And I help singles to discover and dissolve what's been getting in their way. And I spoke at Books and Books. Mine Yay. came out the That's same great. time. So it's all about transformation, having what you want, and not being in conformity, You know, That's not great. listening to the status quo, and you know, pursuing true love. It's That's there. Great. It's possible. That's great. So get the happiness of pursuit, and then get me to marry to solve to, to learn about marriage because be I think set. she's more qualified That's on all that. You need. So You're set for right. life. Yeah. Hey, thanks for coming. Okay. It's good. I, I know that you have the Empire Building Kit, mm -hmm. and I was wondering uh, how many people do you know were successfully able to implement your blueprint? Oh, okay. Um, so what what is your name? Uh, Michael. Michael. What Michael's referring to. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I, I created a business project called the Empire Building Kit, uh, which was focused much more on the kind of things I talked about in the previous book, The $100 Startup. And um, that was essentially a toolkit for lifestyle entrepreneurship um, of helping people to build online businesses such as I've done um, to enable them to have quests and adventures and to travel or whatever it is that they want to do. Um, so your question was how many people have been able to successfully do Yeah. Um, I don't know. Is there anybody here who's successfully done that in their own way, built a lifestyle business? There's somebody right there. Yeah. yeah? Do you have a do you have a, do you have a quick little thirty second <laughs> answer to that? <laughs> well, no. Yeah. Well, you changed my life. <laughs> Absolutely. No. 100%. I didn't put her there. It's okay. No, no, no. It's all right. Uh, so, 100%. so. Thank you. That's very kind of you. 200%. Can you tell tell us about your business? Uh, well, I'm an architect. Okay. And I'm doing um, a new business that is uh, related to holistic architecture. Mm. And I went to World Domination Summit oh, great. in July, and my life completely changed after that. Yay. Thanks to you. Thank you. That's Thank kind. Thank you so much. Thanks. I feel like I should pay these people off later or something. <laughs> like. um, just, a, just a super quick announcement before we wrap up, at least for me. Um, have time. We have time. OK, sure, good. Sure. Uh, so I, I produce this event every year with a number of great people called World Domination Summit. Um, I think some folks have been here. Raise your hand, raise, raise your hand. WDS wow. alumni. That's great. Um, if you would love to, or if you would like to learn more about it, um, I have a postcard here that you can get, get from me. That's it. Okay, we had a hand up here in the front row. Okay, 
Um, what's the most shocking, surprising, and or delightful thing you've come across in your travels, and why? Yeah, I think every traveler has a story of hospitality or unexpected generosity. Every traveler like has this story. I don't know what you think. Like back there, 104 countries. Most people I've talked to like they have some story, right? Of like you know crazy thing. So in my case, um, I was actually in the Comoros, which is this really small island nation um, off the coast of East Africa. It's not a rich nation by any means. And I screwed up. I made a lot of mistakes. And I, I basically ran out of money. And this guy, this local guy, um, essentially paid my way to leave. Like my passport was confiscated. And he like loaned me $50, which was a lot of money. Um, under, under no, like, I mean, I promised to pay it back. But like, how am I going to get him the money? Like, and he's like, here's my email address. you know send it to me and we'll figure it out. Um, and that I was just totally blown away because I could think of lots of places that that might not happen in America or anywhere else that you'd give a stranger $50. Um, but there in this, this poor African country, someone managed to do it for me. And so I've thought about that ever since. I did pay him back. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, the, the title of the book is, is wonderful. Thanks. The happiness of pursuit. I didn't choose it, but thanks. No, really? <laughs> no, I, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, I did, of course, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, my question is, why do you think that we are not taught that it is in the pursuit? Why do I think we're not taught? We're not taught that. Yeah. I don't know, we're not taught a lot of things in life right, that we should, yeah. right? I mean, like... Maybe, it maybe goes back to, you know, the, the idea of, of uh, conformists and non-conformists. Maybe, the, maybe the, those that want us to conform mm. would prefer that we didn't know that it that the richness in life is in the pursuit. Yeah. Well, I'm working on it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know. I think it's something that, that um, I think it's something that sometimes takes time for you to come to, right? Sure. You know, in my case, like I was goal oriented. I still am goal oriented. Um, and I do believe that goals are important. That's why there is a destination. There's always an end to the quest. But um, you can still focus on and enjoy the process and the journey, which is ultimately more important. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. So, as an introvert, um, mm -hmm. I imagine myself arriving alone to a country and <laughs> wanting to meet people, but like not. You know, you know what? I, I'm curious sure. how you start conversations with people. If you if you were um, interacting with people, how you got that started? Yep. There's a lot of different ways. Um, when I started, I was I was mostly staying in small guest houses and hostels. Um, those places are very conducive to conversation. A lot of travelers there. And there's a lot of local folks working who are kind of interested in international stuff. So it's just very natural. Um, you know, over time, like even as I was staying in hotels or something more than, than social media, um, you know, through the blog, or through Twitter. Um, Couchsurfing.org is a great, great resource. You know, you can stay anywhere for free around the world in hosted homes. And it's safe. It's reliable. You can learn about the people before you go. A um, lot of people have had a, a lot of great experiences. Anybody done couch surfing before? It's great. Good experience for you? Awesome. Great. Yeah. Are you an introvert? No. No. OK. <laughs> well, introverts can stay on couch surfing, too. Um, yeah. We have a last question back here. Last question. OK. Um, so my question is, what was the most scenic, um, you know, the, the place that stood out for you the mm. most? Probably the most scenic, surprising place. Yeah. Great, great question. Um, and then I think the guy with 104 countries has to answer it. Sorry to keep looking at you. Um, so I, 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 one of the things I struggle with, like I mentioned anxiety, sometimes I struggle with gratitude as well. And I try to be grateful like every day, but I, but I find myself frustrated with all kinds of ridiculous things. And so I, I have this gratitude practice of like, OK, every day I'm going to try to find like one awesome thing. When I think about unexpected scenic, um, when I went to Bhutan, in Southeast Asia. Did you go to Bhutan? Not yet. Not yet. OK, he'll go. Um, I, I thought it was just an incredibly beautiful place. And even though I struggle with gratitude like almost like every morning, every night, every afternoon, it was impossible to struggle because there were so many beautiful things around. Yeah. All right, did anyone have one last question before we take it? I think, yeah, let's, we'll just let this. All right. Final question. Yeah, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance. What's that? Oh, sorry, you're right. <laughs> You're right. Um, so final question, then he's going he's gonna to wrap us with an answer. Okay. Go ahead. 
Um, you talked about people stopping a quest because of an external circumstance. Could you talk a little bit about internal blocks and just how you come over those, overcome those personally, or what you, how other people sure, have sure. overcome those, or a time where yeah. you couldn't overcome one possibly? Because you, because what was the last part? Uh, or maybe a time when you couldn't overcome one, or just your experience with internal right. blocks. Right. Right. Yeah. Definitely. I think the, um, you know, the internal blocks are probably more challenging in a lot of quests. Right. Um, I think it's it's always so good to think about your motivations and to remember like why did I begin this um, and that's important to think about whether it's an internal block or an external challenge um, it's always important to be like wh why am I doing this and I used to have this uh, wallpaper on my laptop that said why do I do this every single day you know and so I open it up and every day I had to answer that question so whether you're you know that particular about it or not um, in my case, whenever I struggled with whatever those things were, I'm always like, why am I doing this? Because I love the travel, because I love the goal, because I know I'll regret it if I don't, because I find joy in the process. So I always kind of went back to that. I think if you don't have answers like that, that's when you need to think about, is this really the right thing? All right, we have All right, our guest answer back here. Yes. Wow, I didn't realize you were serious. <laughs> um, I would say for me, I think the most picturesque, I think that's probably what you mean, the most picturesque place I've been has been uh, New Zealand. Mm. Um, and yeah. for those of you that have seen the Lord of the Rings, it's, uh, I mean, I was there and I said, wow, God really took his time when he, when <laughs> yeah. he came to New that's Zealand right. because that's great. It, was, it was an amazing place. And was that the place that surprised you? The, the unexpected beauty, I think, was also part of the question. Yes, in a way, because I always thought Australia would have been prettier. Because, mm. but I think Australia has been a lot better, has been more marketed, has been better uh. marketed than New Zealand. But I think New Zealand has been a much easier and better surprise. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> okay, they're holding the applause. That's right. <laughs> All right, folks. So then, if there are no more questions, <laughs> that's great. That's a Thank you. Thank you if there are no more questions, then a quick reminder for our internet audience at home. There's still time for you to call the number on your screen, purchase a copy of the book. We'll have Chris sign it for you, and we'll ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Also, a reminder that all of our live stream events are archived. So if you don't get a chance to watch it live, you could go to the Books and Books website, go to the live streaming link, and any author event that's been broadcast from here in the store will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, for those of you here in the house, we have The Happiness of Pursuit, as well as Chris's previous two books for sale at the counter. He's going to be signing over here at the table to the left of the podium. And this is just one of those great nights at Books and Books. This has been such a great presentation. Yay. Please give Chris Thank a you so much. Thank you.